So, following on on the theme of the Wicker Man, it's interesting to see in today's Sunday Business Post that former Taoiseach current Tánis de Leo Varadkar is now anticipating returning as Taoiseach and sees it as a form of poetry. This is a Jungian process that Ireland is going through. And it must be seen from the bigger picture because one of the problems with many people who are campaigning for change in this country and elsewhere is that they expect, first of all, there to be no resistance to it, and secondly, to get immediate results completely in the first instance. It doesn't work like that. The people who are controlling things both at home here in Ireland and um, internationally are not going to stand back and just allow their agenda to be overturned by a crowd of people on YouTube in Ireland. It's not going to be quite as immediate or quite as simple as that. That does not mean that we are going to lose. It means that we are going to win, but it means that we have to think in the long term. If one looks at, for example, a marquee in which somebody is having a wedding and it starts to rain, the rain gathers on the top of the marquee and it gathers and it gathers and it gathers. And the marquee has lots of protections and it has a framework and perhaps the tarpaulin from what it's made of is very, very strong. So the, to expect the rainwater and all of the individual drops of rain to bring the marquee down immediately is unrealistic. But if there is enough rain over a long enough period of time, the marquee it will eventually bring down. And that's the situation that exists today. People need to stop thinking that individual deeds are going to bring the government down in one step. It's not going to work like that. But those of us with, who do not have cheese brains, <laughs> to borrow Thomas's beautiful, beautiful metaphor, beautiful metaphor, to borrow Thomas's metaphor of cheese brains, those of us who do not have cheese brains are able to look back to <clears throat> before, particularly 2009, when Brian Cowan, that piece of rubbish, took over the role of Taoiseach, and were able to say that in that 11-year trajectory from 2009 up to now, things have changed enormously. The marquee is sagging, to say the least. And it'll be interesting to see where Ireland is if we go from 2009 to 2020. That's 11 years. Let's go to 2031 and see where we're at then. Who knows? And there's no point in even speculating too far. You just have to keep doing what you're doing. You just have to not lose your fear, not lose your nerve. That's like Mrs. Carmody in The Mist. She never lost her fear and she never lost her nerve. But let's talk about Micheál Martin again. Because in today's Sunday Business Post, there's an article about Veradkar speculating about his return to being Taoiseach in 2022. Well, I hope it keeps fine for him. That a man of 40, 41 or 42 years of age would even think of making such a remark. Lends more insight into the person who made a fool of himself at the White House, the person who wrote a letter to Kylie Minogue. It's not a human. I Sorry, I shouldn't use the word person. Who wrote a letter to Kylie Minogue, who... The various different examples of Varadkar's utter sociopathy and crassness and infantility just piles up and piles up and piles up. But okay, John Williams in RTE wants to promote Varadkar. He's fairly clear about that. He's honest about that. He's not attempting, John Williams is not attempting in his capacity as the news editor of RTE to be in any way objective or balanced. Because if he was objective or balanced, he would have been showing up for a long time the very deep personal inadequacies and sociopathy of Leo Varadkar. But Varadkar is now predicting that he'll be Taoiseach again in 2022. Oh, a week is a long time in politics, let alone two years. A week is a long time in politics, let alone two years. But this also takes us back to Micheál Martin and The Wicker Man. The Wicker Man is an incredible film, the 1973 film. It would be difficult to remake it because it has a very 1973 vibe off it. And to try and get back to that wouldn't be possible. It's not authentic to go back to a film that was contemporary of its time. Okay, there are certain editing problems with it. There are certain production standard problems with it. Certain ones. Overall, it's an outstanding film. It's a really, it's a classic piece of cinema. It's one of the greatest pieces of British cinema ever made, The Wicker Man. 
Um, Nihal Martin is the wicker man. There's very, very little that one can say that can compromise the, the wickery manny nature of poor old Mihol Martin. Mihol Martin is a product of a certain type of Irish education and a certain social class of people in this country. He is a do gooder. You see it in his kind of marshmallowy face. He is a do gooder. He has this. And also, as well as being a do-good, there's nothing wrong with wanting to do good for society. There's nothing wrong with wanting to help people. But you need to be fairly sharp and tough. For Mihol Martin is actually just, you know, uh, the tallest poppy in a field of nettles or a field of daisies. It's not as if he'd big boots to fill and taking over as leader of Fianna Fáil after goddamn Brian Cowan. And Mary, the, you know, Mary Coughlin, that lovely girl from Donegal, the foul-mouthed tramp who he put into the role of Tónishta. Jesus, it's not as if he'd big boots to fill. She lost her seat, Mary Cockton did. She still, she still hasn't realised why she lost her seat. The fact that there's no motorway or railway to Donegal, her constituency that she became a TD in at the age of God knows what, 18 or 19. She has, you know, the woman is clueless as well as being ugly and crass. But, you know, RTE is full of clueless, ugly and crass women. They get there like Mary Cockton did because of their families. That's the problem in this country. That's one major problem in this country. Thomas talks about cowardice and mediocrity. Well, that's the culture of mediocrity, that we're willing to elect TDs and tolerate people in our mainstream media who got there because of their families. That's the mediocrity thing. And I suppose cowardice ties into it secondarily insofar as people are not willing to speak out against it. When you speak out against it, you're accused of being rude or accused of rocking the boat. But anyway, Varadkar is back to being Varadkar and undermining Michal Martin as Taoiseach. He's been doing that from the moment Martin became Taoiseach. And people... Some people speculate that Varadkar... Varadkar is doing that maliciously. He's not doing that maliciously because Varadkar is not that deep or intelligent. Varadkar does not have the intelligence to be malicious. He's too stupid. He's too pathetically, imbecilically juvenile to think that far or that deeply. It ties back again to what was said many times before. A, a desperately inadequate man for Adgar is only where he is because of RTE and the Irish Times. It's the only reason why this thing has been inflicted upon us. He very nearly lost his seat at the election. But what became apparent when he didn't lose his seat was that there was an eruption of jazz hands in Montrose and the Irish Times and generally in Ranala. And they would begin immediately passing it off as the greatest election victory since Reagan in 1984. And they have. They've completely memory hold the fact that Varadkar very nearly lost his seat. But no, 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 no. That's Fine Gael for you. Another gaslight by the mainstream media in this country is that Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil are, ident are identical parties. What you are effectively doing by saying that is looking at the two tips of icebergs. But the what's below the waterline with both Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil is strikingly different and historically extremely different. And indeed, it goes back much longer even than the foundation of the state. Fine Gael is the present day relic of essentially Norman Ireland. So, the, and I'm not condemning the Normans or that. I won't go that far into it at this stage. But Fine Gael is coming from the background of the British establishment in Ireland. Fianna Fáil is not. Fine Gael likes to say that they founded the state. What Fine Gael founded was the Irish Free State in 1922. In 1922, the Irish Free State was a British dominion. It had the same constitutional status as Canada or as Australia or as New Zealand had then. The present day constitution of Ireland was created in 1936 and it was created by Eamon de Valera and Fianna Fáil. It is a Republican constitution. Fine Gael or whatever they were called in 1936, the blue shirts or 
I can't believe it's not the fascist party of Ireland, whatever they were called. They did not create the constitution and they did not support it. And the constitution of 1936, although it didn't pull Ireland out of the British Empire at that particular stage, would lead to being the springboard which would cause Ireland to pull out of the British Empire in 1949 with the unilateral declaration of the Republic of Ireland. But Fine Gael didn't do this. Fine Gael followed in the footsteps of Fianna Fáil. Fine Gael today is the most subversive and mendacious influence in this country. It is worse than the Greens because it's not quite as insane, at least on the top of it. They're all insane. They're all re- they're psychopaths. They're really, really twisted individuals but behind both the Green Party and Fine Gael. But the Green Party are not as talented at hiding their insanity. So you have, you know, barking wankers like Eamon Ryan going round and the other losers in, in the Green Party. And this is not their fault. If there are wolves outside the house and you open the front door and let them in, you're to blame. And the Irish people voted for these. They voted for these things back in February. They had their chance. And they they blew it. They blew it badly and they're paying a very, very dear price for it now. Because this government is not going to fall. People are thinking, oh, you know, can we do this or do that? And the government, they'll be gone in a week. No, they won't. They'll be around for four years. They will do everything they can to hold on to power for four years. And there's a hidden gaslight in that as well. Micheál Martin was the first leader of... Fianna Foyle not to top the poll in his constituency and not to be elected on the first count. Leo Varadkar was the first leader of Fine Gael and the first sitting Taoiseach not to top the poll in his constituency and not to be elected on the first count. This speaks volumes. And What we have instead, actually the only one of the three wankers who are in government now who topped the poll and got elected in the first count was Ryan. But that's because his constituency is primarily Ranala and they are quite simply beyond rescue. But let's not talk about Ranala. So the gaslight that's going on is a message being sent to the Irish people. You rejected Veradkar, you rejected Martin, you rejected Fianna Fáil, you rejected Fine Gael and we had a Fine Gael government prior to the election. Now we have a Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil government. So the message is clear, although RTE, of course, won't say this and the Irish Times won't say this. The message is clear. Your vote doesn't count. That's what's being told to the Irish people. Your vote doesn't count. You didn't want either Fine Gael or Fianna Fáil, so instead you got both. It reminds me a little bit of the 2000 presidential election in the US because Bush... did not win the popular vote. Gore won the popular vote. Although at a personal level, Bush is probably, Bush number two, would probably actually be a more likeable individual and have a stronger sense of humour than Gore. Gore, I mean, in many regards, in retrospect, we can see it was good that Gore didn't become president in 2000. Ironically, if Gore had had run again in 2004, he would probably have beaten Bush because John Kerry came very close to beating Bush in 2004. But the message sent to the American people was, in 2000, it doesn't really matter how you vote because this is just going to be, this is a foregone conclusion. And that was, for the first time in my life, the election this year in Ireland was a message to the Irish people. It doesn't matter how you vote, we'll stitch this one up to suit ourselves. Now, I don't agree. It very much matters how you vote. I have one Doyle vote and two Shannon votes, which is another matter which I won't discuss here. It very much matters how you vote. And this is the gaslight that's being done. They're lying to you when they say you shouldn't vote. They're lying to you when you say your vote doesn't count. Your vote very much does count. If we remember the presidential election of a while back, of 2018, That was a shock to the whole RTE Club Montrose establishment because Peter Casey polled far better than was expected. In terms of the popular vote, Peter Casey won nearly 25%. 
For an outside candidate who was just really dicking around, Peter Casey did impressively well. But getting back to Micheál Martin and the wicker man. Economics talks louder than anything else. Money talks louder than anything else. What we're seeing now in Ireland is a situation of complete ruin. And it's very serious. It's easy for people who are reasonably stable to talk speculative to talk speculatively about it and to be somewhat objective. But I came across two security guards in the past fortnight who were working not far from my home. Both of them were sleeping in their cars and were working for minimum wage and were men in their mid to late thirties. They both have children, they're not married. Those men have have a challenge as they go further into middle age. Because obviously they're not in a position to put money aside. Obviously they're not in a position to plan for a pension or to plan for what might be politely called retirement. And the outlook for those men, at the risk of being pessimistic, the outlook for those men is frankly quite bleak. It didn't have to be this way. When my parents got married at the age of 27, they were able to get a mortgage immediately and they had it paid off in about three or four years. That was similar for my parents' siblings. And I think that this is an insight that I get from having parents who were 43 when I was born. Effectively, my parents could have been my grandparents. Generationally, they could have been my grandparents. And it gives you an insight talking to them and talking to my aunts and uncles. And my cousins, all of them were older than me. My cousins are, some of them are in their middle 60s, some of my cousins. It's interesting to compare how easy it was for middle class and working class people like my parents to get ahead in those days in comparison to now. All of those ladders that people could climb have been stolen from them. And this is going to talk louder than the Irish Times or than people like Durin Garrahy who bawled her way through Leo's speech. I bawled, bawled my way through Leo's speech. Leo. I actually don't think she's part of Club Montrose because she's not bright enough. She's just this loud skank in RTE. This grating loud skank who just comes out with shite all the time. But she's trying to ingratiate herself with that circle who who all hover around Veradkar. I mean, it's really pathetic and cringe, the stuff she came out with about Veradkar. You know, um, but what's not being reported is that whatever... RTE or Durin Garrahy or the Irish Times, the cat ladies and cokeheads in the Irish Times might come out with. What will talk louder than any of those cretins is money. Money talks louder than anything else. And very quickly, and we're seeing it, I've seen it more in the past 10 days and two weeks, and we're going to be seeing it accelerate into November. Quickly, a lot of people are going to be extremely destitute. So when they can't feed themselves or clothe themselves or roof themselves or find a bed to sleep in, as those two security guards had that challenge of, they didn't know where they were going to be sleeping. They were working on minimum wage on a film set close to my home, where everybody else in the film set was also working on minimum wage. Once that really explodes within the next two to three weeks, then no amount of bullshit or wokeness or Eamon Ryan's crap in the Irish Times or Leo Varadkar's crap on the Late Late Show, nothing is going to stop what's coming in relation to the momentum and anger that arises from those people. And this gets back to the paradigm regarding the lockdown and COVID-19. However dangerous COVID-19 might even have been at the start, nothing warranted what was done to this country from March until now. Nothing warranted it. It was totally disproportionate and it was done without any consideration of another story. That's not even talking about what we're refusing to wear masks. It's talking about the lockdown and the destruction that's been done to our businesses. Small businesses, hotels, shops, they're facing utter destitution. I spoke to people back in March when the first lockdown happened and I said to every single small shopkeeper or business owner I spoke to, close now, sell, sack all your stuff, get rid of your stock, do a fire sale and get out. The sick is sh- this ship is sinking, jump ship now. No, they wouldn't. It was like the Titanic. 
When the Titanic hit the iceberg, the clever people stopped playing music and they ran for the lifeboats. They ran for the lifeboats in when the Titanic was hit. And it was very cruel to see who survived in the Titanic and who did not. Very cruel. But this is what's happening. The survivors are the people who jumped ship. I jumped ship in 2012. I won't even go into details about what happened, but I saw all this coming. Because I listened to George Carlin's rule when George Carlin said, the government is always lying. If in doubt, remember they're lying. Carlin was right. Oh, no, no, he was just a comedian, a hippie in New York. No, 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 no. Let's listen to RTE and continue to vote for Nigel. At present in the Hope Peninsula, there are over 50 houses for sale long term. Now, the Irish Times, the lying cocksuckers that they are, the Irish Times like to talk about how the property market is holding up. No, what the Irish Times is referring to is asking price. They are not referring to selling price because, quite simply, nobody's buying. Nobody's buying. Nobody's buying any property. Nobody's buying. You see all these big mansion houses for sale in places like Kalini and Rathgar and Hoth and all the rest of it. Nobody's buying. Because the people who have the capital to buy these things know what's going to happen. That a house that was worth two million in 2018 won't be worth 200,000 in 2021. And unfortunately, and it's a very iron rule of economics, the value of anything that you wish to sell is only what the next person is willing to pay for it. So whatever filthy lies the Irish Times come out with on their property website and in their property pages, all of these middle class people who join the property ladder and who have exorbitant mortgages, they are fucked. So this is not just going to affect security guards. It's affecting those kind of people now. But watch what happens after November or December or January. Watch how that'll move. Because when a collapse happens, like the Wall Street crash of 1929, it starts by teetering. But then when the actual crash happens, it happens in the space of days. It's like when disco died in the 70s. Disco died overnight, literally overnight. When Terry and June were doing disco or Larry Grayson was doing disco, that was the warning sign. That was the red flag. Well, you know, when dis- when something has gone on to kind of afternoon, you know, pebble mill at one, when they're doing disco on pebble mill at one, that's a sign that the trend has moved. That's a sign that the trend has moved. Michal Martin is the wicker man. He's going to end up paying a very, very, very high price for what he's done. Because right up to the end, and if you look at the wicker man, that poor foolish sergeant should have realised that these people had given him warning after warning after warning. They had given him warnings left, right and centre and he would not heed it. But it was still not too late near the very end of the Wicker Man. This is a plot spoiler. This is a plot spoiler. I'll put a plot spoiler alert on the cover card with this. When he realised that he was going to be sacrificed, he could have run for the cliffs and thrown himself over. And that would have been either a quicker death or a chance to survive, rather than when they tied him up and put him into the wicker man and set fire to it with him. Ironically, watching the film, what distressed me was the animals that were burnt alive in the wicker man. I didn't give a shit about him because he deserved it. And as Lord Summerhill, or think it was Summer Isle, Lord Summer Isle said to him, you came here of your own free will. You took on the power of a king. You're an idiot. And you're also a virgin. That not being particularly relevant. But those first three things were the reasons why he broke three pagan laws. He was also disrespectful to the people on the island as well. Michal Martin had his chance. He had his chance even in February. He had his chance in June of this year. His chance was to walk away. Throw yourself over the cliffs. Get away. No, 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 no. Martin had to keep going. That stupid do-gooder man with his doughy face and his weak smile. He had to keep going. He had to keep going. Martin did. So... He could have turned around and just spoken out in his capacity as a TD and said, this is all a lie. This is all wrong. What's being done to the people of this country is a violation. 
I remember his first speech in the Doyle after the general election. I said to him, I was hanging on it. It was, and it's rarely I hang on what politicians say. Rarely, rarely. But I was wondering, I said, now, what's he going to come out with? What's he going to come out with? And he starts talking about climate change and Greta Thunberg. Well, I said, he deserves whatever he gets. He deserves whatever he gets. So, you know, um, the warning signs are always there, but they're not, they're only valid if you're willing to listen to them. You cannot heed a warning you cannot benefit from a warning unless you're open-minded enough and intelligent enough to see what's coming the character in the wicker man got warnings left right and center and he was too caught up in his own religiosity and being a do-gooder actually similar to Michal martin to see what was coming until it was just absolutely too late and Michal martin is the same you are the fool mr Harry. punch one of the great fool victims of history. For you have accepted the role of king for a day. And who but a fool would do that? But you will be revered and anointed as a king. No matter what you do, you can't change the fact that I believe in the life eternal as promised to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in the life eternal, as promised to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. That is good, for believing what you do, we confer upon you a rare gift these days, a martyr's death. You will not only have life eternal, but you will sit with the saints among the elect Come. It is time to keep your appointment with the wicker man. Oh God! Oh Jesus Christ! Oh God! Oh Jesus Christ! Oh God! Oh Jesus Christ!